Can you fold your queens on this low connected turn? It's a tough spot. Hello everyone, I'm Jonathan Little. I'm here today with episode 328 of Weekly Poker Hand. I want to thank you for being here with me today. Today we're looking at a hand from a 2-2 no-limit game at Best Bet Jacksonville. Here we have Kevin in the cutoff with 10 nine of spades. Very solid hand. He raises it up to $15 out of his, we'll call it $400 stack. So the players are 200 Big blinds deep. Maybe there's a straddle in the spot. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. He raises it up with a 10-9 suited to 15 bucks. And around to Ron with pocket queens and the big blind who re-raises. If you are going to re-raise in this scenario, take a second. Ask yourself how much you should make it. Your opponent makes it $15. If you want a three bet, how much should you make it in this scenario? This is an important point. You want to make sure you fully understand because when you re-raise small to $40, like Ron does, while $40 may normally be a pretty big bet in your game, it's not when your opponent already has 15 in there. Whenever you make it 40, your opponent has to put in $25 more into an $80 pot. So what you're basically saying is, I think my hand is so good that you're not going to be able to realize 30% equity in position with whatever reasonable hand you raise with from the cutoff. And that's just not true. Not here we do see that the pocket queens have 80% equity, but that's if we were all in immediately. You have to realize that Kevin's only going to put a lot more money in after the flop when he significantly improves his 10-9 of spades, right? So while Ron is investing a little bit of money ahead immediately, when he does happen to be beat, he's going to end up having his money in very close to dead a lot of the time when Kevin makes a straight or two pair or a flush with his 10-9 of spades. So this is a spot where when you're going to re-raise from out of position, you usually want to make it about four times your opponent's initial raise when you are deep stacked. That's usually going to cut down on their implied odds and make it to where they probably should fold hands even as good as 10-9 of spades, but a lot of people don't. And that's going to result in little bits of equity going your way. Whereas whenever you re-raise small, while you are investing money profitably before the flop, your opponent's not really making an error. And you make money from poker when your opponents make an error. So... He does re-raise to 40. Kevin confidently calls in position. If you're listening to this on an audio device, by the way, you can watch the video at youtube.com slash poker coaching. If you're watching on YouTube right now, click like, click subscribe. I would appreciate it. Waiting for the dealer to get his head out of the way. All right, here we go. Flop comes pretty great for the 10-9 of spades. It comes 8-7-6, two hearts, one spade. And this is a pretty bad flop for Ron because he probably has almost no small connected cards or small pairs in his big blind, small three betting range. It's another big problem if you do use various bet sizes because if he uses only uh, the best hands to re-raise small from out of position, then this board just completely misses him. And when the board completely misses you, you do have to be very, very cautious. Also, when the board should connect pretty well with your opponent, you have to be very cautious. That said, I think in most small stakes games against people who are generally straightforward, you probably want to go ahead and bet this hand with the intention of actually folding it if they raise you. Now, if your opponent's crazy and aggressive and will raise any like nine here for an open into straight draw or any 10 for a gut shot, obviously you can't fold. That would be a disaster. But against most people who are weak, tight, straightforward, they're only going to raise you with very good hands. So this is a situation where I think you can get away with betting in most small stakes games, but in higher stakes games, you should very likely check because when you check, it gives your opponent the opportunity to bluff. Whereas when you bet in this scenario, you generally force your opponent to play somewhat well. Now on this board, 876, if you are going to bet, you typically want to be betting using a pretty big bet size because we should generally be betting with our best made hands and our draws. And queen certainly is one of our best hands on this board, right? Our draws would be flush draws, maybe backdoor spade draws, etc. So I'd be betting something like $60 in this scenario if I am going to bet from Ron. You typically don't want to go too small on coordinated boards because when your opponent does call, they're going to have loads of equity, right? So anyway, let's see what happens. He's given it some thought. Actually, sorry, Ron immediately checked. Ha! Kevin now bets $50 into the $84 pot, which I think is nice. So in this scenario, 
Ron does decide to check. Now Kevin with the nuts bets. And I think that is the only play that makes any sense whatsoever. When you have an effective nut hand on a board that is coordinated, you always want to be betting. Now, you may say, what if my opponent has ace-king? He's going to fold. Yeah, you may not get any value from ace-king, but if your opponent is capable of checking over pairs or checking flush draws or check calling with ace-king anyway, because ace-king's still pretty live normally on 8 7 six, you certainly want to be betting. A big mistake a lot of people make is to slow play their hands to death. What a lot of people do here is they'll just check behind the flop, check behind the turn, and then bet the river and get one $50 bet. Whereas your goal here is to stack your opponent. So definitely make sure you are not slow playing. Slow playing is bad. Do not do that. All right, so he bets 50 bucks, and Ron pretty quickly calls with the pocket queens, which I think is fine. Um, I would caution you to not just like instantly check call in scenarios like this, because when you instantly check call, it kind of implies that you have a decently strong hand. Now, if you have a decently strong hand and your opponent still keeps betting on the turn, what should you do? Well, you should fold, right? Because if you have announced by check calling quickly that you like your hand and your opponent still wants to put money in the pot, they must have something pretty good. So if they must have something pretty good, what is pretty good on eight, seven, six? You really think your opponent's just blasting their money with pocket tens, no problem? Maybe they are if they overvalue hands, but for the most part, I think you're going to be against sets and straights and two pairs and very good draws, like straight flush draws. So anyway, Ron does quickly check turn. Kevin should probably just go ahead and bet again. Pot's 184 bucks, $300 remain in stacks. I think you can bet $75 in this scenario because you know your opponent's dead or basically dead, and you want to do everything you can to keep them in the pot. You don't want to go too big here, like all in for 1.5 times pot because then your opponent may start making big folds. And also, you don't even want to go like 200 or 150 because that also puts your opponent in a scenario where their whole stack is at risk. At this point, I think you'd much prefer to go smaller to kind of make your opponent feel like they are forced to stick around in the pot. So let's see how much he does bet. Pot was 184. He goes 150. So I'm not a big fan of 150. So notice in this scenario, Kevin actually had $310 in his stack. So he bet half of his stack on the turn. In games where you can bet any amount, very often you're going to find that you want to ask, do I want fold equity here? Like, do I want my opponent to be able to fold in this scenario? And like right here, the answer is obviously not. You may think, oh, but I could get outdrawn if a heart comes or the board pairs. Like, yeah, you could, but more often, if you think about your opponent's range, when they do check call flop and check call, or when they do check call flop and check turn, they probably have either ace high, which is drawing dead, or they have an over pair, which is drawing dead. So here, um, Ron is going to be drawing dead the vast majority of the time of this whole range. So when he's drawing dead the vast majority of the time, you don't really care about the various draws, right? So this is a spot where I definitely would have gone smaller. And now when Kevin does bet 150, he makes it impossible for Ron to make a big error with a hand like Ace-King. Because if you do bet $60 or $70 on the turn, Ace-King may call again, just completely dead. Now you may say, if you bet 150, maybe Queens and Kings and Aces goes all in. True, but you're probably going to stack those anyway. So the goal is not really, how do I get money out of Aces, Kings, Queens? The goal is, how do I get money out of Ace High and random nonsense that I could perhaps induce to bluff? You're going to find that when you have a value hand, your main concern is, how do I get action from the widest range of marginal hands compared to, how do I protect my hand? Because very often, you're not really, even against hands that have any equity, like in this scenario. Okay, so now... You're in Ron's shoes. Your opponent bet the flop. You called. And they now potted the turn, putting in half of their stack. Can you possibly fold your queens? Can you fold your queens? Let me know in the comment section. Can you fold your queens on this low connected turn? It's a tough spot. I think we have to go back to the logic I used on the flop, where once you check call flop pretty quickly, pretty confidently, unless your opponent thinks that quick check call is all weak, which probably isn't. Like, I mean, you're probably not snap check calling ace king, right? Maybe you are, maybe you aren't, but most people don't. If you're check calling with obviously an overpair on the flop, and now 
your opponent has bet half of their stack, the size of the pot on the turn, should we fold? And I think the answer is actually yes. Very rarely am I trying to fold an overpair. And I promise you, I'm not being results oriented because I see that he's drawing dead. But when your opponent and Kevin Shoes here does take such a strong line, the only time you are actually getting your money in good here is when he has exactly jacks, tens, or nines. And I don't think you need to be blasting it with any of those hands because those hands have plenty of showdown value. Or when you're against a good draw. But even then, good draws have loads of outs, right? Like a good draw here is going to be something like ace nine of hearts or ace 10 of hearts. They have nine, 10, 11, 12, 12 ish outs, 12, sorry, 12, 13, 14, 15. They're like 15 outs or 18 outs. They have a load of outs, right? So when you're against that many outs, like, yeah, you're ahead, but it's not like you're thrilled about it. So when you're against the better made hands, straights and sets and two pair, you are almost dead. So you have 0% equity then, or 10% equity or something like that. Against the draws, you have 65 ish percent equity. And what that amounts to is that given there are a lot of nut hands on 876, I think you just need to make the reluctant fold. I don't want to fold. I hate folding. But this is a spot where I think Ron just has to make the fold. The other problem is, is that you can't really call in this spot because if you call and leave Kevin with 150, he's going to know to not keep bluffing the river for 150 into what will be a, what, $750 pot? Is that right? It'll, it's, I'm kind of confused by the size of the pot here. Whatever it is, 100, 160 into... Um, yeah, I guess the pot would be, uh, what, five, 650, 650? Yeah, something like that. You're not you're not giving yourself very good odds on your bluff, right? You're basically, your opponent's very, very pot committed. So you don't really want to call because when your opponent is drawing, you want to make sure you are getting it in um, ahead at the moment. But the problem is, is whenever you're dead, you're just putting in the whole remaining $300 in your stack, basically dead. So I don't like it. I think you have to fold. Let's see what Ron does. Ron actually quickly went all in. No thought required. He gets it in, drawing stone, dead. And he ships all of his chips over there to Kevin. Tough spot for Ron. And I think this is a spot where a lot of people kind of just view this as a cooler or they automatically stack off. And while it could be an automatic stack off against more loose, aggressive opponents, I definitely think that's reasonable. It very likely is not, especially against the more tight, passive, straightforward opponents. And especially when your opponents are just like, blasting their chips in the pot. When they are blasting their chips in the pot, you must be disciplined and make the fold. So that's going to be it for this episode of Weekly Poker Hand. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, click like, click subscribe. Thanks for being here, and I'll talk to you next time. Thanks for taking the time to watch this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want more strategy lessons, preflop charts, and interactive quizzes, make sure you get your free membership to PokerCoaching.com right now at PokerCoaching.com free. I'll talk to you next time.